हाई एवरी वन सो एज पार्ट ऑफ आर डिस्कशन ऑन एक्स्ट्रा कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल बॉडीज वी ऑलरेडी हैव कवर्ड इंपॉर्टेंट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन लाइक नीति आयोग प्लानिंग कमीशन वी ऑलरेडी हैव डिस्कस एन एच आर सी एस एच आर सी सेंट्रल इन्फॉर्मेशन कमीशन स्टेट इन्फॉर्मेशन कमीशन सेंट्रल विजिलेंस कमीशन सो नाउ वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अनदर टॉपिक दैट इज सी बी आई सेंट्रल ब्यूरो ऑफ इन्वेस्टिगेशन इन दिस वीडियो सो विदाउट वेस्टिंग टाइम लेट इज मूव टू द नेक्स्ट स्लाइड एंड लेट इज स्टार्ट डिस्कसिंग द स्कोप ऑफ दिस पर्टिकुलर वीडियो हाउ विल be discussing this chapter that is cbi so first as usual we'll be discussing what and why aspect of the cbi that why this institute what is this cbi central bureau of investigation and why this institution was created in the first place thereafter we'll be discussing that how through various years you had this institution establishment of institution called special police establishment in 1941 and thereafter the another landmark year is going to be 1946 then 1963 1998 then 2014 so how this cbi uh, as a organization has reformed throughout these years so evolution of cbi will be discussing into the second leg of this video and then we'll be discussing even before discussing this evolution of the cbi we'll be discussing what is this concept of general consent and the specific consent by various state and then we'll be discussing the jurisdiction of the cbi functions of the D, uh, cbi and the working of the cbi as usual again in the last leg of this video there are three mcq that has been appended for you to attempt so without again wasting time let us move to the next slide and let us start discussing what aspect of the cbi that what is this cbi so cbi is central apex police institution now here into the first line of the, the definition of the cbi itself you can raise a question right that hey you are calling it a police institution but the police policing was the function of what you call states right you had something called schedule 7 that you had taught us right and into the schedule 7 you talked about division of legislative affair so here you had this list 1 you, you have list 2 and you had this concurrent list right so list 1 whatever legislative function has been mentioned into the list 1 that was being done by the union that is being dealt by the union and in list 2 you have whatever legislative affair that has been mentioned that will be function or uh, that will be handled by the state so into the list 2 you have this entry 2 and into entry 2 you have this law and order and policing law and order and policing so this policing was supposed to be a function of state and now here it is you are saying that it is going to be a central apex policing institution so yes you heard it right so but the policing institution or the policing function that cbi will be performing right that will be only in relation to the central again here the correction is needed when i am saying only into the relation of the center so the dpsc act the dpsc act will be studying later part in the later part of this video the dpsc act delhi police establishment dpsc act 1946 through which the cbi as a organization is going to drive its function it is going to drive its power right so in the dpsc act in 1963 when this institution was created right in 1963 this institution is going to drive the powers or the function so in this dpsc act uh there were two option the first option was that it is going to perform the policing function only into the relation of central uh central government employees uh, psu employees and the public sector bank so whatever corruption cases that will be reported from the public sector bank what will be the whatever corruption cases that will be uh, reported from the public sector undertaking by the central government or whatever uh, uh, corruption cases that will be reported by the central government or central government employee like income tax or lic those kind of cases will be looked in by cbi the another thing that was defined into this dpsc act was that if now here is the interesting point that if the states want right to take the services right and this is the interesting and the curious point and this is how cbi is going to enter into the states as well so here into the second point of the dpsc act as far as the policing function of the cbi is concerned right so it was defined that if the state wants the uh, services of this apex premier investigation why i am calling this apex uh, this institution as apex police institution or premier uh, uh, police institution 
solution because of the expertise that it is going to get. We will see into the later part of video when we will see the nature of crime that it is uh, going to uh, investigate from the nature of crime. You can gaze that what kind of expertise or even means you would have noticed that in every case, every damn case you, you from the state there is a recommendation that CBI is to investigate. You had this Tutukuri case, you have this Sushant murder case, you had various kind of any damn case that state police cannot uh, investigate. Yeah, there would be call from the media, there would be call from social organization that CBI should be allowed to come into and perhaps to on the CBI's expertise, right, most of the people does believe. So, here the option that was inserted into the DPSC Act that yes, means we are not going to violate whatever sovereignty that states has been given into the legislative affair by the schedule 7, but option that we are giving is that if state wants to take our services in any particular case, right? So, you will have to as a state, you will have to sign a PAFOMA and that PAFOMA will be decided by Ministry of Home Affair and in that PAFOMA, you will be giving us a general consent. So, here you do have these two kind of consent, right? One is called general consent and another is called case by case consent. Uh, what is this case by case consent? So, if mentioned in Sushant murder case, right, although the recommendation had come from this uh, Bihar police, but if Maharashtra government, there was wide amount of means even before Bihar police intervention into the Sushant murder case, there was wide demand from the Maharashtra people itself from, from media organization that CBI because the hoach poach or uh, the way, uh, the botched up uh, way that police had uh, was handling, Mumbai police was handling this case, nobody had trust on that. So, there was demand from, so the, from the either this uh, state government is going to urge central government on the case by case basis that hey, can you look, can you ask the CBI to look into this particular case, right? So, that is by case, means consent case by, on the basis of case by case. Now, another consent is this general type of consent where you will be signing every state means who which so is whoever state not every it is not essential in essential signing this PAFOMA by the MHA is not essential right but right now almost every state has signed this general consent and this general consent is not signed by the state for the uh, lifelong these general consents are generally signed routinely by for uh, by states for six months or maybe one year or by two years that, that, that period will be mentioned in this PAFOMA itself when states will be signing. So, this general consent is nothing means when we will get into the later part of video you will notice that you do have this anti-corruption branches of the CBI that is located almost in every state to deal with the corruption cases by the public sector employee or the central government employee or the PSUs right. So, it is because of this general consent that the CBI in that particular state get to investigate those kind of cases. So, that was about this general case, right? So, as uh, so here you would have seen that we have already proved that CBI although is a police institution and although even though this police uh, policing function or the law and order handling function has been assigned to the state police or to the state into the list too, right? Even uh, this central police institution created by the central government it is not violating the state sovereignty. I hope you will have clarity on this particular point. So, CBI is a central apex police institution in India to investigate cases which has interstate, again I am saying the definition what aspect of CBI while I am defining on this particular slide, it is not going to be uh, what you call Pathar uh, Pelakir, right? So, uh, we will keep amending the definition or the function here, uh, we are uh, defining the functions of the CBI, but there are many more functions that CBI does perform in addition to these functions. It is just that to define that what aspect of the CBI we have put up certain functions here, right? So, in to investigate cases which has interstate or international ramification, right? You will notice that the CBI will also be called Interpol, right? You, I hope you do have some idea on Interpol, right? So, uh, this, this is going to be a connecting agency between the police organizations of various worlds. So, as a Interpol as well, whatever communication that Interpol does have, that Interpol will be communicating with the CBI, Central Bureau of, so this is a connecting Point, right. So, ramification and especially concerned with the major crimes 
or economic offenses of the country right so i hope that point since it has been created by a executive resolution it is going to be a executive body not a statutory or not a constitutional body major crimes of the country right but what about state jurisdiction so this point we already have discussed no cbi does not violate states states so generality in sphere of law and order unless state gives general consent to the cbi cbi does not take cases so how does cbi generally takes the cases right cbi means it, it does not take auto cases it will not take up automatically cases about speaking about this general consent so at times you would have noticed means a year ago you had this two state not a year ago i guess two years ago uh, this news is of 2018 so two years ago you had these two states ap andhra pradesh and west bengal ap although for ap withdrawing this general consent from the cbi it was completely polit uh, political decision because here uh, two years ago this ap government was being led by this chandra babu naidu right and he few means until 2017 he was part of nda but then due to some political differences he withdrew from nda and thereafter there was cbi raids right so those cvi raids as well uh, were politically oriented and considering that ap uh, took the lead andhra pradesh took the lead and it disallowed that uh, cbi will not miss uh, it it withdrew this general consent that it had given to the uh, cbi right and through which when a state has withdrawn the general so here again one interesting point and that is not mentioned into the slide so you can make a note of it so if a state decides to miss once it has given a general consent suppose uh, um, uttarakhand or uttar pradesh has given a consent for next two years suppose in 2020 for two years until 2020 i i as a state i as a uttar pradesh chief minister or cabinet has given the consent that okay cbi can investigate in to my state until 2020 but in midway i decide to withdraw this general consent i am means constitution has given i mean this uh, not constitution but dpsc act had this act 1946 does have provision that this withdrawn this general consent can be withdrawn but here whatever ongoing yes in future cbi will not be able to take up any case in that particular state unless again that state approves the general consent right so here once a state has uh, withdrawn the general consent in that case although cbi will not be able to get uh, to investigate any future cases but whatever cases and this is an important point whatever cases that cbi was investigating hitherto right cbi will continue to investigate those kind of cases right so this is not mentioned into the slide you can make note of uh, this particular point here so you had these two states andhra pradesh and west bengal which had withdrawn its uh, consent for um, uh, for the cbi investigation later on when there was government change in the andhra pradesh andhra pradesh has already again provided this consent there was wide spread criticism in the andhra pradesh when chandra babu naidu led government had withdrawn the consent that because he wants to protect his uh, own party corrupt party leader so th that political aspects we are not getting into right so i hope the general what is this general consent how what rights that uh, andhra pradesh or any state does have even after means providing this general consent they can withdraw it so all these aspects i hope you do have clarity on now we were discussing one point that we had led midway and that was that how does cbi get to get into any particular case so if i take up uh, the example of this shushant right so how does cbi took the case of this shushant case so you had the request from the state itself and the request although it was not from the maharashtra government it was from the bihar police because bihar police as well had filed one particular case in the uh, one particular fir in that regard and thereafter bihar government requested uh, central government to take to check that whether cbi can take uh, the case or not so the first method through which cbi can take cases right although again i am telling you we'll be discussing this in the later part of this video that although these kind of murder these kind of criminal thing these kind of robbery quality although is a function to be performed to be supposed to be performed by the state police but you will notice when state police uh, is inefficient if if the people find it incompetent they build the pressure on the state police or on the state government right 
to have the CBI in that particular cases by involvement of various kind of social organization by various uh, NGOs by various media organizations right. So, the first way is that either state should request right a state should a state makes request to the center and thereafter center should approve that request it's not that a state does not have any particular right to assert that CBI should or CBI shall consult uh, uh, investigate that particular case. So, states can be assertive center needs to and center when while approving it also takes uh, what you call not approval from the CBA, but at least it consults CBA director whether they do have occupancy or not right. So, that is the first method through which CBA does take case and thereafter if there is any ongoing case like you had this uh, one particular uh, case in Uttar Pradesh where you had MLA has already been convicted into that rape case where you had this girl from I, I do not remember the famous infamous district right he happened to be a BJP MLA itself right. So, right now he is convicted and uh, uh, the uh, the relatives of that girl had already died into the accident. I cannot recall that particular case. So, in those kind of cases, you will notice that if High Court or Supreme Court is not satisfied with the functioning of the state police in that case, Supreme Court or High Court as well can direct CBI that hey CBI take this case state police is not capable state police is acting at the behest of its political masters right so you take up the case so in that case as well so this is going to be a second method in which cbi will be taking up the case so these are the two methods through which cbi does take case this point we already uh, did we discuss this cbi drives its jurisdiction from the dpsc act when we will be discussing this evolution of the cbi what is this dpsc act 1946 and who designed this dpsc act <coughs> sorry 1946 we will be discussing this thing in detail manner there right. CBI initially had this point we already have discussed the CBI initially had passed to investigate the central government employee corruption in ministry and union territory right to investigate crimes in a state this concept of general consent right. So, this point you should emphasize on that this concept of general consent was introduced into the DPSC act 1946 only those states which approved this general consent CBI could investigate the cases. So, I hope these points that how uh, does CBI takes up the cases or jurisdiction of CBI you will have clarity on right. We are moving to the next slide to discuss the nature of cases that is handled by the CBI. So, do you do you really want me to discuss the nature of cases that is handled because through the media channels through uh, newspaper you already would be reading what kind of cases. So, you have any kind of case that is dealing with the money laundering that is dealing with economic fugitive that is dealing with the corruption that is dealing with violation of any of the central law where central finance has been impacted cases which are essentially against central government employee cases where the financial interest of the central government employee is concerned fraud cheating embezzlement of funds. So, these kind of cases you will notice or if there is any professional organ drug rackets although uh, into the drugs cases you have this NCB which does have a specialized function, but to some degree initial preliminary or uh, investigation into even in drugs cases, although later it can be transferred to the NCB, but initial preliminary uh, investigation can be done. So, any kind of professional organized any kind of racket right any kind of cartel any kind of professional organized crime is there. So, those kind of crimes will be investigated investigated by none other than the CBI then international cooperation in police that we already have discussed that Interpol it is a Interpol of a Interpol connecting point of India right. So, whatever communication that Interpol or the world police does have right. So, the connecting point here is the CBI cases having interstate. So, this point in the definition itself what aspect of the CBI we have dis discussed that the cases having interstate or international ramifications. So, those kind of cases as well will be investigated by the CBI right. So, without wasting time let us move to the next slide and let us start discussing the evolution of the Central Bureau of Investigation. So, these are the landmark years of in the process of evolution of Central Bureau of Investigation, these are the landmark. So, I have just given you a glimpse of landmark here. Now, let us 
start discussing these years one by one. So you had the first landmark year is 1941 and uh, if you remember what was this period famous for? So we were still in 1941, we got independence in 1947 until 1941, right? We were still a British colony and the important world event that was ongoing during this period was World War II. What was the period of this World War II? So World War II happened from 1939 to 1945. So Britishers, uh, means on behalf of Britishers, Indian military was also participating in this mega fest, right? That was World War II. And uh, because they, they, these Indians were participating in Indian military, I mean, was participating into the World War II, you will see that there were many manufacturers and many means government was the agency which was in purchase of arms and ammunition and thereafter there were many manufacturers at that moment who had actively uh, started this manufacturing business of weapon and the government was the purchaser in this purchase and sale of arms and ammunition there was huge scale of corruption that had ongoing now an institution was established and an institution was named special police establishment spe at that means in 1941 to gaze the amount of corruption that government uh, officials had done. So the purpose of establishing this means right now this institution will not be known as CBI, Central Bureau of Investigation. You will notice that this institution will be named Central Bureau of Investigation only in 1963 means until 1963 this institution will be known only as special, establish, special police establishment. So in 1941 you will notice that this special police establishment this is an institution right as we do have CBI today similarly Britishers had created this institution named special police establishment in 1941. So the mandate the basic purpose or the primary purpose of this special police establishment in 1941 was to investigate the cases of corruption in which these Britishers, British officials had uh, indulged in during the sale sorry purchase of uh, these arms and ammunition from these manufacturing company. So once the mandate was over, thereafter you will notice that in the Britishers comes with this Del Delhi Police Establishment Act in 1946 and this, this institution, Special Police Establishment is given some additional function. So whatever function until 1963 you will notice that this institution, Special Police Establishment will continue to work. Uh, with the function that will be assigned through the Delhi Police Establishment Act 1946. Now, uh, you had this year 1962 and in year 1962 you had this committee, sorry, commission on anti-corruption that had been established, right? Do you remember that? We had discussed this in previous chapters as well. That was of CVC, Central Vigilance Commission. So there we had discussed the establishment of anti-corruption committee, right? And on the recommendation of this means this anti-corruption committee uh, had commission had been uh, uh, led by this K. Sanathanan and due to the famous personality, due to the heavy personality of this K. Sanathan, this uh, commission will be known as King Sanathanan Commission as well. On the recommendation of this commission, you will notice that we had already discussed that in 1964, uh, CVC had been established, but a year earlier than establishment of Central Vigilance Commission in 1963 you will notice that the central bureau of investigation will be established and when i'm saying central bureau of in investigation will be established it is not going to be a new institution completely from very scratch rather this special police establishment will be renamed as central bureau of investigation and how this institution will be created so this institution that is cbi will be created by a executive resolution now i need not to tell you what is the meaning of this executive resolution so whenever any institution is created by executive resolution that body will be called executive body this point i am repeating because i have repeated this point in previous video as well that when we were discussing the central vigilance commission right so this uh, body will be created by the executive resolution by ministry of home affairs now this point is also important because uh, right now means in 1963 the administrative control of the cbi will remain remain with 
Ministry of Home Affairs, this MHA is nothing, Ministry of Home Affairs, but later on, later on, at a later stage, you will notice that the administrative control of CBI will be released by MHA and it will be given to Department of Personal and Training, which is a body that acts directly under the supervision of PMO Prime Minister's office. So, right now the position of the Central Bureau of Investigation is that right now it is under the administrative control of Department of uh, Personal and Training and not the original institution or not the original ministry which has which had created it that is Ministry of Home Affairs. So, I hope this point you will have clarity on still means uh, okay institution of CBI has been created or rather this institution has been renamed as CBI but this CBI where it will draw its mandate, where it will draw its power, where it will draw its functions. So, it will continue driving its function from this Delhi Police Establishment Act 1946 and even today means uh, right now I was talking about this year 1963 but even today that is 2020 this institution called CBI Central Bureau of Investigation continue to draw its parts, its function, its jurisdiction from the same act that is Delhi Police Establishment Act 1946. Uh, 6 right. So, this was the second landmark year 1963. Now, this uh, from 1963 until 1998 why this year 1998 has been taken I will let you know right the, before that there is another point. So, whatever we have discussed about the administrative control of CBI. So, that has been put up here into the textual format CBI was created as executive body by the resolution of Ministry of Home Affairs which was later transferred to Department of Personal and Training administrative control and right now it is under the administrative control of department of personal and training right so uh, from 1963 this institution starts its functioning what is the role and what is the function we'll be discussing this right uh, that will delve into but from 1963 because see the problem with this institution from 1963 to uh, 1998 rather even today 20 the primary problem of this institution is that because this happens to be an executive body now you already know when we uh, uh, were discussing this election commission there we had differentiated between the constitutional body a statutory body and executive body to, to the executive body we had said uh, there clearly described there that the executive body is going to be most weakest body why we had applied their reasoning as well that because the executive body has been created by the government of the day and the function whatever function that they have been assigned whatever accountability measure right that uh, has been defined into the acts right so those account because government has created this body so this institution will be accountable not to the parliament but to the government right and since this institution the executive body is going to be accountable to the government and not to the parliament you will see continuous political interference even today CBI means although it has very good reputation even in Sushant Singh murder case you had means police uh, the state police which could not solve the case in 62 days you have these initial leads that is coming up within 20 days of its investigation right so it has solved many a cases but you will notice but that because this institution is ultimately eventually under control of government there would be allegation and there have been allegation at every time and rather from supreme court not by the politician we can if the criticism is by politician we can ignore it calling it a case of political uh, vendetta or calling it a case of that uh, particular party want to uh, score some or settle some political points at the ruling party but the criticism has been in supreme from supreme court itself and in 2013 you will notice the scathing remark came from the supreme court where the supreme court is going to describe this institution as keys the parrot and that is very very demeaning undignifying for any institution to be described a institution which does have solved so many cases it is very demeaning and it is not the problem with this particular institution rather the accountability measures or rather the control will see how the multiplicity means this institution is going to the CBI is going to be controlled by many of the institution right it does not have its own cadre so right now we are not getting into that so the thing that I was talking about that from 1963 to 1998 or even 
until 2020 this institution has got despite its good track record in investigation in solving the crime in solving the crime it has very good reputation rather 60 to 70 percent of the cases it has sold it has prosecuted the people it has uh, taken it to the logical conclusion and for an investigating agency uh, that has track record of taking so many cases such percentage right that institution is considered as an elite institution when I am I, I compare it at the world level right. So, still means there have been despite this kind of track record there have been time and again the uh, what you call allegation against this institution that this institution uh, if you have been keeping up update uh, with the cu current affair you had this Rakesh Asthana work, uh, versus this Alok Verma case or Nageswar Rai case, I am not sure, right? It was perhaps Rakesh Asthana plus Alok Singh case, right? So, in that uh, case as well, there was uh, allegation that uh, this particular person, the special director, was a appointee, political appointee rather, although the, he happened to be IPS officer, but there were allegations that he happened to be political appointee of the ruling government and whatever he was doing in the institution, he was doing on the behest of uh, government of the day, right. So, there have been allegations and it is due to this allegation that you will notice into this 1998, into this Vinit. This case has been very famous and this case we had discussed into the CVC chapter as well, Central Vigilance Commission chapter as well, Vinit Narayan case versus Union of India, right. So, this case is alternatively also called Hawala, Jain Hawala case and what this case was about. So, you had a very famous politician and these famous politician had uh, sent some money through Hawala by the Jain brothers and those case has come into limelight, but CBI through its investigation had given clean it to those politicians. When this case went into the Supreme Court, this Vinit Narayan versus Union of India, right, this is Jain, means as I already told you that this is case is infamously called Jain Hawala case as well. So, among various other uh, insights that uh, Supreme Court gave about CVC and other things, among the other remarks about the CBI, it gave these kind of remarks. It talked about extending autonomy to the CBI, it talked about giving more functional autonomy uh, to CBI, it talked about some role, some additional role to be given to the CVC in the chapter of CVC as well. This case we had discussed into the CBC as well, right. So, in relation to the CBI, the remarks that Supreme Court uh, gave in relation to the CBI was that insulate CBI director from the political interference and there should be fixed tenure of two years, right. So, why th this provision would have been made, why this provision of two years fixed tenure. So, if uh, the director of uh, any organization does have fixed tenure, at least he can ensure some amount of, if he do not have fear of continuous transfer within next three years. Uh, three months or four months right at least to some degree he can means I cannot say because this organization this director will be at the end of day he will be appointed by the central government as well and post completion of his project or as a tenure of two years again he will have to seek appointment uh, from the central government to any other place. So, of course, there will be some amount of greed, some amount of fear, some amount of inducement, but at least if two years, at least two years of the tenure is guaranteed, right, he can secure some amount of some degree of functional autonomy. So, that was uh, the first measure. The second measure the Supreme Court suggested was that the CBC should have supervisory role over the CBI. So, this point we already have discussed that in 2003 when this uh, CBC Act, right, CBC Act 2003 will come, you will notice that uh, in relation to the anti-defection cases, right, anti uh, sorry, not anti-defection, anti-corruption cases, whatever anti-corruption cases, means CBI ke upar, uh, CVC ka complete control to nahi aega, but at least in relation to whatever cases that will be dealt by CBI in relation to the anti-corruption or the corruption related cases, right, in those cases you will notice the CVC will have supervisory role over the CBI and because CVC is a statutory means in 2003 until means until 1998 even CVC was a executive body, but in 2003 the CVC will be uh, will be given a statutory status and since a statutory body is overseeing 
uh, the functions of uh, uh, having the supervisory role over the CBI, you can expect that again the CVC will ensure that insulation that CBI, uh, sorry, Supreme Court was talking about. So that was the second measure. The third measure was that if before two years, okay, you assign the two years fixed tenure to the director, but there may be some extraordinary, very extraordinary situation where this person is very talented and he has to be given some very important assignment. In that case, if transfer of the CBI director in extraordinary situation for very important assignment should have approval of the selection panel, which selection panel will notice that, right? Right, what kind of selection panel it is talking about in the next slide we do have selection panel. So it's not that the government will simply take the decision, right? It should have the approval means if you are transferring the director, it should have approval of the selection panel. The selection panel will see. So this was about in 1998 and following the directions of the Supreme Court means here the government had been reprimanded for casing in the CBI and CBC both, right? So this decision uh, was means uh, uh, right now we are not getting into the details of this Vinit Narayan. We are just limiting uh, on the Supreme Court's observation over the CBI, right? But here Supreme Court in general had attacked or reprimanded government for uh, keeping the CBI inst important institution which had been created with a very fair objective of controlling corruption, of uh, maintaining integrity into the public life, of ensuring that the public life, people from the public life remains incorruptible. So these kind of institution if is being controlled by the government, right? So Supreme Court in that regard had reprimanded this government and it is because of that reprimanding by the government you will notice that in 2003 government is going to come up with this new act that is CVC Act 2003 and through the CVC Act 2003 you will notice that in cases of anti-corruption or in cases of corruption that CBI will be handling you will notice <coughs> that supervisory role will be given to the CB, uh, CVC central uh, civil uh, central vigilance commission right and the central vigilance commission will be given a statutory status in 2003 all those statutory st status should have been given to the cbi which is until today pending as well but at least to some degree you can say that at least cbi when uh, uh, when it is dealing with this corruption related cases, right, at least to that point CBI will have some degree of independence because CB, uh, CVC has been given supervisory function, right. Thereafter the second thing that it do, did was that the first suggestion the Supreme Court had extended, that first suggestion is going to be implemented, right? that is two years fixed tenure was given to the director of CBI. Recently you had when you had this Alok Verma who had been reinstated, right? He had uh, uh, taken this ground that why, uh, how can government divest me of, uh, divest me of all the power that the government before this two years. So here the reinstatement of Alok Verma uh, had happened on this particular ground, right? So this was about the evolution process until 2003. Now the next landmark year is going to be 2013 when you had this Lokpal and Lok Yukta Act and through Lokpal and Lok Yukta Act you will notice that two kind of panel will be created. One panel for the appointment of the director of the CBI and another panel is going to be created for the selection of, I am not talking about the appointment. So here all these people will be appointed. I hope you do understand the difference between appointment and the selection, right? So here all these people that we are going to talk about, it is going to be appointed by the central government, but the central government will be only appointing authority only when the this selection panel has chosen a particular person, right? So for the director, director, uh, this Lokpal and Lok Ayukta Act 2013 that is going to create two kind of panel, right? So central government shall appoint CBI director on the recommendation of a panel. Which panel? the director will be appointed on the recommendation or so this is going to be panel for the recommendation so here you will have list of pool of talents right that has been recommended uh, by MHA plus uh, UPSC right and from that pool of talent you will notice that this selection panel considering uh, consisting of prime minister a chairman 
and then you have chief justice of india or any of his nominee or any of his representative from the supreme court he could be judge only it can't be that uh, chief justice of india's nominee is going to be any advocate or any person like you or me no he will be supreme he or she will be supreme court judge only so that selection panel is going to selection panel for the cbi director i am talking about the other ranks official selection panel will gaze right now right so prime minister chief justice of india and leader of opposition into the lok sabha on this point as well this star uh, in 2013 this star was not there but leader of opposition this provision is going to be amended again because in 2014 you will notice that you had uh, no party who uh, who had this leader of who had been given this leader of opposition post into the lok sabha so in 2014 amendment will be made and here a point had uh, will be put that if the lok sabha does not have a recognized leader of opposition in that case this particular representative or this particular person will come from the party which has secured largest number of seat right so that was about what happened in 2014 as well so right now we were talking about the selection panel for uh, recommendation of directors recommendation right officials above sp rank so you do have see in cbi as well you have this ranking the way we do have ranking into the police so in uh, uh, cbi as well we do have various kind of ranking you do have ac uh, asi assistant sub inspector who are appointed through examination that is conducted by this ssc then you have inspector rank official you have this so pretend a uh, deputy sp you do have so similar structure that we do have in police organization because ultimately see this cbi is also nothing but a police uh police organization so above sp you have this uh, inspector deputy sp and then sp and thereafter you will have various kind of post so above sp and till director right so director has been appointed by on the recommendation of this panel right so starting from sp till deputy director right except the director will be selected by a selection panel and that selection panel will be consisting of these people right so here again the panel is going to be different and this panel we have discussed into the cvc chapter as well so you will have all the members of uh, central vigilance commission uh, where by uh, the central vigilance commission uh, chairman right he will be the chairperson and all the two members and thereafter you will have secretary to the ministry of home affairs and secretary to the dopt department of personal and training and ultimately this panel is going to among the available pool of talent right this panel is going to recommend that which person should be appointed superintendent of police which person should be appointed what which person should be appointed what so here you you do have two kind of selection panel one panel which will be recommending the director right and here one thing that you will have to notice that uh, whenever this panel is considering any name it will be considering the advice i'm saying considering the advice of outgoing director of the cbi as well his advice will also be taken into account it is not that his advice will be concurred but his opinion will also be taken into account so these two panels you will have to remember right this panel is for the recommendation for the director and this panel for another post starting from sp till director right except means except that direct so i hope that point you will have clarity on the another landmark year is going to be 2014 and in 2014 only this point will be changed because earlier it was leader of opposition right but in 2014 no, no party is going to secure this leader uh, no party will get this leader of opposition post and in that regard this amendment will be made that whichever party has secured highest number his or her that party's representative will be uh, on this panel so amendment when ls does not have recognized leader of opposition leader of largest party in the ls be part of selection panel of the cbi director so i hope the evolution process of this uh, cbi here it should have been the cbi so uh, evolution process of the cbi you will have clarity on now we are moving to the next slide to discuss the composition of the cbi composition of the organization so as i already told you the positions you already would have clarity on that you do have various kind of so you do have one cbi director 
right and besides the director to help him you will have you can have this additional director you can have a special director you can have joint director and then you do have this dedicated post uh, regarding this i was saying that you can have right depending on the org organizational workload right government means central government may uh, choose to have these people that is additional director, special director and the joint director. But this director that is director of prosecution, right? This uh, director of when you are referring to the director of CBI that is going to be one person. But here the director of prosecution, you should not confuse this director of prosecution with the director of CBI. This, this prosecution department is going to be totally different and it is this department, right? That is uh, and that is under the anti-corruption that is going to be supervised by this central vigilance commission right so this director of prosecution is completely a dedicated post right so that was about the composition and besides this, these are the top, uh, top ranking official besides this uh, as i already told you that you will have asi you do have inspector rank official you do have deputy sp sp various colloquial staff whole of the administrative staff that you will have now how these people are appointed so the top people right sp and above we already have discussed that how you had this uh, selection panel which was recommending and thereafter central government was directly appointing them right you will have means from various state when a sp when a deputy sp is brought into so for deputy sp for the sp you will notice uh, let us discuss the another point and thereafter this point we will discuss so see from the transactional level if we start asi the first post the first uh, lowest ranking official into the investigated investigation department i am talking about so there you will have this asi and asi is brought by this process of examination conducted by this ssc right thereafter uh, this ASI only once he has served four or five or six years, he will be promoted as SI, he will be promoted as inspector as we do have into the police system. If you go to the uh, these higher ups, higher officials, SP and above, right, so those people are deputed. I am saying deputed from various state or various union territories. So here it is the role of MHA that is going to come right so mha is going to recommend that which ips officer and which whosoever is going to be deputed in these uh, organization at the higher uh, levels right you will notice that most of those people are going to be the ips officer and it is because of this mha does have power to decide at least PPR means MHA will not have complete power because we already have seen that the selection panels role right and even before that you do have the involvement of UPSC as well. So MHA is just going to provide the list of so if four or five people has to be deputed so for those four or five people MHA will prepare list of at least 100 means uh, 90 to 100 of uh, eligible IPS officer and out of that UPSC will be scrutinizing some and thereafter you will have this selection election panel. So that is how these people, the organizational structure or the organization of CBI works, right? So higher officials are either selected or brought on deputation from the states and union territory and it is because of this deputation power of ministry of, because this ministry of home affairs is going to be manned by a politician who will have be from this ruling party and because he happens to be, uh, means uh, besides being minister of home affairs into the government, he is a politician as well and there is because of this deputation because see if a uh, IPS officer who has served in a particular state for seven or eight years if he is brought into this CBI so he will always like to be in CBI right once he has entered into the CBI right so suppose if he has uh, been deputed from the state for two years now whether he will get extension or not it will entirely depends on MHA's uh, MHA's recommendation so here comes the chances of manipulation here comes the chances so here due to the promotion power here due to the future posting so here this inducement and this fear will continue to work and it is here it is because of these kind of power that cbi has been described as the case parrot it is because of these kind of power that cbi's independent functioning will be compromised it is these kind of power that the central government does have uh, on deciding that which person is going to be deputed for how long he or she will stay into the CBI whether he'll 
uh, get extension into the CBA or whether he'll return, he or she will return to the state. So it is because of these kind of power of the MHA Ministry of Home Affairs that there is chances of manipulation, vulnerable for manipulation, right? And that's why these people, CBI as an organization has been alleged that it its functioning is compromised at times, right? CBI also conducts direct recru recruitment, these points we already have discussed. So this was about the composition of CBI as an organization. If I talk about the divisions in the CBI, so you do have these kind of divisions. You have this economic offenses division, you do have policy department, you do have administrative, administrative division, you have central forensic lab, you do have these economic offenses uh, wing, you do have this policy division. So these kind of division or these kind of wings that CBI has been divided into out of these wings right we'll be studying these three important wings because what would be the job of this administrative division this will be looking into the administrative affairs of the central bureau what is the job of this central forensic laboratory so collection of forensic information and this analysis of those forensic information right so these are technical organization it will be looking into the administrative administration it will be looking into the policy affairs it is these three organize these three wings or three divisions of uh, this CBI that is going to be important that is special the one dealing with the special crimes right you do have various kind of cyber security various kind of internal security uh, problems that will be dealt by this special crimes division then you do have uh, uh, money laundering cases you do have economic fugitive that will be dealt by this economic offense division will be dealing this in detail right and then you do have this anti-corruption division where you do have various uh, central bank official you do have these PSUs you do have various uh, uh, ministers central ministers right or any person related uh, which impacts the health of central government finances right so it will be dealt by this anti-corruption division right so this was about this divisions into the CBI let us take these three divisions one by one and let us start discussing so what would be the job of this anti-corruption division so first of all whatever cases of corruption that it will receive right so the anti-corruption if you notice or if you know in almost every state you do have this anti-corruption branch of the CBI. If you want to see here one snapshot that I have taken from regarding this offices I have taken from the CBI website as well, right? Uh, so ACB Delhi, ACB Jaipur, ACB uh, anti-corruption branch we are talking about, right? So ACB Jodhpur, you do have ACP, ACB Bhopal, ACP Jabalpur, ACB Chhattisgarh. So on these lines in almost every state you do have this ACB offices. All these anti-corruption branches located in various state will be dealing with the cases of corruption and with central government employee, central uh, PSB, public sector bank, public sector undertaking, employees has been indulging. So those kind of corruption cases it will be dealing with, it will be indulging into this intelligence gathering related to that uh, what you call uh, corruption cases and it will be working in tandem with the civil uh, Central Vigilance Commission and the Vigilance Officer located in various ministry, right? So they will be coordinating with the uh, uh, those vigilance officers. Uh, I already have told you that you do have these CBO Civil uh, uh, Chief Vigilance Officer located in various kind of Central Ministry Office or various kind of uh, dep Central Department, right? So it will be this organization that is anti-corruption branches located in various state capital. They will be continuously sharing information with the CBO in various kind of newspaper you would have heard that anti-corruption branch of CBI had raided this building or has raided or uh, caught this particular bank manager recently you had this bank of Baroda's uh, chief uh, a manager that had been caught red-handed so these kind of activities you will notice will be done by this anti-corruption branch of the CBI now let us move to the next slide and let us start discussing this special crimes division so what this special crimes division does is so any case uh, any case of espionage any sabotage any case of uh, internal security problem if any organization any terrorist organization or any organization that has been uh, that is trying to indulge in right in uh, that is uh, that is going to cause any kind of internal security so these these are the functions of the special crimes division any murder any dacoity any kind of uh, criminal activities right that although this criminal breach of trust and these kind of activities 
will be performed by the state police but under this category right now although the uh, investigation of the Sushant murder case right that was the job of state police but when state police urges or the state government urges CBI considering that our police may not have that level of expertise because these people uh, while serving in various the IPS officer or various officer that are working with the CBI right this intense scrutiny or the intense amount of job that they do they will attain a level of expertise that generally is not seen in the state police so those kind of crimes right cheating criminal so these crimes though generally might seem that why these cases are uh, uh, sent to the CBI rather uh, considering that we do have in list to policing function has been assigned to the CBI right why CBI should be given function but you would have seen that Sarda chit fund scam right so that was what criminal breach of trust right why the Sarda so under these kind of mandate that CBI is transferred cases right so I hope that clarity about the role of the special crimes division you will have clarity on the last division uh, we are going to study on the next slide that is economic offenses wing so what economic offenses wing or the CBI will be dealing what kind of cases this economic offense wing will be dealing with so it will be dealing with the cases indulging with the money right financial crimes any kind of financial any kind of economic fugitive visa malaya lalit malaya so these kind of cases will be dealt by uh, these uh, people uh, what you call uh, cbi's economic offense division right you do have this mehul choksi who which agency is looking so you will have a cbi looking into the case along in tandem with the ed even in this Shoshant case you have the cbi continuously working in tandem with the ed what these telegram notification okay of this so these were about these three uh, wings or three div important divisions of the CBI right so that was regarding these division now let us move to the next slide and let us start discussing this prevention of corruption act 1988 although this prevention of corruption act 1988 is a very extensive topic and we can discuss the provision of this prevention of corruption act 1988 for around half an hour at least right and that prevention of corruption act even from uh, the governance angle not from the Indian polity angle but from the governance angle this uh, uh, act is going to be important but because right now we are dealing with the CB we will be restricting uh, our discussion on this PCA the provisions of this PCA will be restricting ourselves only to the provision that is relevant for the CBI so one provision of the PCA uh, prevention of corruption act 1988 that is relevant for the cbi is that one particular provision of uh, this pca generally as well pca had this amendment recently in uh, so right now we are discussing this uh, pca 1988 and in this pca 1988 there is one provision that if any uh, agency any investigating agency be it police be it ed be it any investigating agency if he, they have to start any investigation against the central government employee they need to have approval of uh, the competent authority even before initiating a preliminary inquiry and this provision has been made further and stringent by an amendment so until two years ago only until three years ago there was this provision that if a person ranking above this joint officer rank a joint secretary rank right if he or she if there is any inquiry that is to be investigated by the CBI then they will have to have permission from the central government right so that was the provision and that provision besides has been put into the PCA 1988 that provision had been inserted into the sixth schedule of DP, uh, DPSC Act itself it is the DP Delhi Police Establishment Act from which uh, the CBI uh, invites or CBI drives its power in that uh, act itself this uh, provision had been inserted that if any inquiry has to be initiated by the CBI above for against any official against secretary above rank of joint secretary then in that case they will have to have approval from the competent authority that is central government but the supreme court in 2017 you will notice has held this invalid calling it violative of article 14 right the supreme court in 2017 held as invalid the legal provision that makes prior sanction mandatory right 
and the protection of there is one Hindu link that I will be sharing uh, into the description of this particular video and that uh, Hindu link if you could read from the 2017 rather in Lakshmi Khan over this particular uh, topic uh, over this particular header there is uh, this width of article that is written and that article is nothing in Lakshmi Khan that article is nothing uh, that article is simply copy paste from that the Hindu article. So, that Hindu article link I will be sharing into the description link, right. So, although in that Hindu link, right, uh, that the, the normal it would be a 5 minute read that Hindu link would be, but the crux of the matter, crux of whole of that uh, the Hindu link or the in the Lakshmi Kant as well when you will read, right, it is like a 3 or 4 minutes read. I will have to stop this notification like this. Just a moment. Okay, so we were talking about, so even in Lakshmi Kant, it is going to be a 3 or 4 minutes read, but the crux of the matter is the same thing that the Supreme Court has invalidated right now, that it has, the Supreme Court has called that or just on the basis of rank, right, the CBA is not going to decide, does not matter if a person happens to be a SP or a person happens to be a simple, I means additional secretary or joint secretary, irrespective of the, uh, what you call, uh, the position he or she is holding, right, if CBI's anti-corruption department has received any case against a particular person, right, he or she will not be given any kind of preferential treatment just on the basis of what you call uh, his or her rank that he or she is holding. That will because that will be violative of this article 14, right. You guys have started talking on this telegram group. Okay, next video onwards, I will stop this notification while recording, but right now. So, this was about this CBI and PC and 1988, right? The next thing is CBI and RTI. In 2013, see, RTI does have this provision. RTI among various sections, it does have a section called section, uh, come on, stop it. So, RTI among various sections, you do have this uh, section 8. Right? And in this section 8, certain organization has been mentioned and those organization, mm -hmm. just a moment, give me a moment. Let me just, uh, what do I need to do? Should I disconnect the internet connection as of now? Just a moment, give me a moment. Okay. So, this was your telegram discussion group, ok, let it load and thereafter again we will start discussing. Hmm. Ok. So, what I was discussing, I was discussing about this section 8 and, and just a moment, I will have to take the pen. So, in this section 8, certain kind of organizations has been mentioned and those organization uh, has been given exemption. What is this RTI? I hope you do have this uh, information on this RTI, right? RTI is nothing but right to information. Under, the, under this, every citizen is empowered that whatever information that you would like to have from the government, right, you can ask that information. But then you cannot ask information on the nuclear bomb, that where nuclear bombs are located. You cannot ask from the government that, okay, uh, what amount of supply or what amount of weapon that you are supplying right now on the Ladakh border. So, those kind of sensitive information, you cannot ask from the government under the garb of right to information. So, certain kind of organization under this section 8, right, has been give, given exemption that these organize from these organization, if some sensitive information that you are asking which will impact the security and sovereignty and integrity of India, so those information can be denied, those information may be called that, hey, we cannot share those kind of information. So, until 2013, the CBI did not figure in this list, but in 2013, you will notice the CBI, along with the CBI, you do have agencies like NIA and uh, National Intelligence Grid. So, these three organizations will also be put up in this list, that is section 8 of the RTI and the meaning of this uh, putting the CBI is going to be that from CBI as well, you cannot seek any kind of information, but that 
thing will be objected by the Supreme Delhi High Court and Delhi High Court will rule in 2017 again that RTI is a tool of accountability and by putting this CBI into this RTI right CBI although is marred with many kind of allegation of political corruption or political interference and if you are giving the CBI or if you are putting the CBI into the section 8 of RTI then again whatever accountability that CBI does have through this RTI or whatever fear the CBI officials will have right so those fears will completely go and there will be wide amount of political interference and those political interference cannot be unearthed if CBI is put into that list of exemptions right so uh, means whatever blanket exemption that uh, here Delhi High Court as well will completely it will not say that completely remove from uh, this organization that is CBI from uh, list uh, section 8 of the RTI but it will say it will give a marginal judgment and in that marginal judgment it will say that whatever cases that CBI is dealing with in relation to the corruption and in relation to the human rights so these two I am repeating in whatever cases that CBI is dealing in relation to the corruption and whatever cases it is dealing in relation to the human rights in those kind of cases if any person any citizen is seeking any information under the RTI CBI will have to share that information right so that was about the CBI and RTI so right now what is the position so the position is that CBI although because of this exemption this government notification although it does have certain level of protection it will not share all the kind of information under this RTI act but whenever uh, a case a particular case is falling under these two categories that is corruption and human rights if you are asking any information CBI will be or CBI is compelled to share the information now what are the problems with the CBI if the in the problem domain if I talk about so the one basic problem is political interference right and that political interference emanates because of the multiple controls over the CBI what kind of multiple control that I am talking about so CBI does have control in some major to some degree of the MHA and not to the some degree this MHA Ministry of Home Affairs is going to assert wide amount of control right so you do have means cadre management cadre clearance when I am saying cadre clearance I am talking about these IPS uh, what you call uh, deputation right so as I already told you into the previous slide that whenever this list will be prepared right this list of the ta uh, talent pool right that will be although you do have selection panel but selection panel right will be choosing from this list itself right and thereafter whether that particular person once uh, within the CBI a particular IPS from a state has been brought into the CBI how long he will stay into the CBI CBI that will be decided by this Ministry of Home Affairs right so again there is chance of that political interference because of this MHA's role right so control of the Ministry of Home Affairs right thereafter Department of Personal and Training you will see that whatever because uh, the CBI is under the administrative control right it is a executive organization it is not a statutory organization so this is under administrative control of this DOPT and whatever budget it has to approve get approval of its budget right from this DOPT induction of non IPS officer will be done by this department of personnel and training now what is the role of another role is of law ministry ministry of law affairs so you do have uh, this panel of lawyers you do have this battery of lawyers that CBI does have so CBI if has filed any kind of case right it do, does have besides having what you call uh, this investigating officer it does have special courts as well so in Sushant case right although his father does have money right so he can this his, he can have his own lawyer rather he has appointed his own lawyer as well but if there is any person aggrieved where government of India right is on another side and the another accused it on another side right so here you will notice that CBI is going to bring its own lawyer right so CBI does have battery of lawyers now where these lawyers will be and who is going to appoint that which lawyer will be part of that battery of lawyer for the CBI so that will be cleared by this law ministry so this is going to be the third ministry which will have control which is going to exert control over the CBI then UPSC uh, what role UPSC will have that we already have discussed then CVC as well central vigilance commission will also have supervisory role although it is a kind of reform but yet 
uh, this uh, CBI is answerable to these many organization, these many ministry, these many agency and when a particular agency, a particular investigating agency that is CBI does have these, this amount of control, it is going to, it is not going to be do a independent investigation, right? It is going to be a disaster and that disaster, it is because of these control measures, it is because of these many answerability that you will notice that you do have various kind of allegation that is being leveled as I already told you despite a track record of solving this 60 to 70 percent of the cases it is marred with the, these kind of allegation and it is because of this multiple answerability, multiple control, multiple puncture points. So, what are the reform? If you have to suggest any kind of reform that what kind of reform should be brought into the CBI to insulate it from the political uh, control. So, the reform that I will be suggesting is that first of all make this organization statutory, give this statutory status and that statutory status will ensure or will give autonomy in its functioning, right. So, recognize this body that is CBI as statutory body by a separate parliamentary control. Once it is a statutory body, right, thereafter ensure that this organization rather than being answerable to those many departments that we were talking about, it is answerable to a parti uh, particular parliamentary committee, right. So, make a parliamentary committee and make the CBI director accountable. The way we do have RBI, right? We do the way we do have CAG, right? So, on those lines, we can make this organization that is CV, uh, CBI answerable to that particular parliamentary committee. So, these two reform, right? Thereafter, its autonomy should be on par with the bodies like CAG and which is accountable only to the Parliament. So, this is the third reform and the th fourth reform and the most important reform is that CBI rather than relying on the Ministry of Home Affairs for its cadre management, right, for those kind of deputation from various states, rather it shall develop its own cadre, right, rather than having people from the deputation, it should be allowed that the ASI that has been appointed or rather whatever even at the middle ranking official right it should be it should have power the way this upsc is conducting examination right for this ips official uh, this on the similar line these people should also be given power that they could manage their own cadre rather than seeking people from people on deputation from various state or various union territory. So, these are the four reform that I have collected right from various sources. So, these are the four reform in regards to the CBI that you can mention. So, with this we are wrapping up this lecture right with these three MCQ that is first. So, this is the first MCQ, second and third MCQ. So, these are the three MCQ that I expect you to attempt until we come up with the next lecture. Till then, bye-bye.